welcome back to Film Studio Otaku. Based on features and disregarding the size and weight that come with this class of camera, the Nikon Z9 is the best possible mirrorless all-purpose camera currently on the market. Camera X, Y, or Z may have this, that, and that, but the Z9 has this, that, that, and a whole lot of holy f So now what? Well, the Z9, I think, is more than most need and should likely be wanting to spend on a camera at the moment. We all want a lot of what it has to offer, but is it really the right camera for you? And if not, what options do you have to get some of that Z9 tang in your life without spending a small fortune? In my opinion, many should be doing something that may seem hard to do after three years of what seemed like a new camera rolling out every month, and that is to wait. Basically, what the Z9 has done is open the doors. Beyond what it is capable of, which now includes internal RAW capabilities, the Z9 was made future-proof. You cannot release an 8.3K 60 frames per second 12-bit internal RAW flagship monster of a camera and not have the power to release meaningful firmware updates for years to come. Yes, it's already blown the doors off the industry in many respects. And yes, it is unlikely that any updates, at least anytime soon, will rival the 420 updates. But there will undoubtedly be updates coming for at least the next five years, likely longer. As a Nikon professional flagship, it's not a camera intended to be replaced every other year. And it may in fact be five years or more before its successor appears. What this means is that any competitor truly trying to go toe to toe with this beast cannot last just on marketing hype and a few surface deep upper spec features that may be above what the Z9 currently has. Its core potential, not just what it is at face value, has to be on par with the Z9, which just keeps me coming back to the staggering reality though of what the Z9 is at current face value. Pretty much the only thing it lacks from being my dream camera is global shutter. And who's to say they won't just throw that in down the road? So what I mean by weight more specifically, and this is aimed at all including those wanting a flagship from their non-Nikon camera company, is that most of this greatness is indeed coming your way, likely much sooner than you think. For some, depending on their system, the weight may be longer and the caveats may be greater, but the high water mark has been greatly raised and there's no going back at this point, and there can be no doubt that other companies are already, at the very least, planning something to compete directly and also raising the bar for their future lower-end cameras so that they can try to match some of what has just been offered and what can likely be expected of Nikon and other big camera companies going forward from here. Rather than focus on full-frame flagships, I'm going to kind of focus here on... APS-C. Now, I had originally made this video a few weeks back, but due to technical issues, this is a re-reshoot, and now Fujifilm is days away from their summit. XH2 leaks and info are going to be pouring in, but just like Fujifilm surely took some notes on the Z9, and others undoubtedly will be taking notes on the highly anticipated XH2, and it may very well affect what is surely coming from Nikon in regards to APS-C, Nikon has released only one APS-C camera for their Z mount. Two if you count the ZFC as a separate camera, and I'm not going to get into that whole can of worms. And I also don't want to get bogged down in details about model numbers, but Nikon has a history of releasing a wide range of APS-C and full frame cameras in their DSLR F mount lineup. Unless Nikon has changed the core of how they sell cameras, we can expect several more APS-C Z mount cameras in the not so distant future. And I would guess that at least two within the next year or year and a half. And at least one of those two, I predict, will be the Nikon flagship APS-C, which people should be very, very excited about. Not only upper level enthusiasts, but professionals alike. So the best current APS-C offering in F-mount from Nikon 
is by miles better than the APS-C offerings in Z-mount, and it's the D500, which is an amazing camera. A good friend of mine here in Japan actually shoots with this camera exclusively, except when he sends it in to have the shutter renewed by Nikon twice a year. He borrows another camera. Now that's not a slight against Nikon and it's not a joke. Uh, I believe that camera is rated for something like 500,000 shutter actuations. Uh, this guy just shoots more photos than anyone I know. I never see him without his camera and he is always shooting. The D500 though is a splendid camera which still costs between 1600 and about 1800 USD new. It's six years old and has seemingly ceased production only this year, which hmm, why would they cease production? Hmm. The D500 is a 21 megapixel, megapixel 10 frames per second camera capable of 200 raw shots at that speed and it shoots 4K up to 30 frames per second and full HD up to 60 frames per second, which is very impressive for six years ago. It has one standard SD slot and an XQD or CF Express slot, which I didn't even honestly know that XQD was a thing six years ago. It has a 2.3 million dot tilting touchscreen LCD, uh, which still rivals and beats some out there today. The viewfinder is optical, it's a pentaprism, so you're actually looking directly through the camera's optics. So the resolution is that of your eye and high quality optics. It has phase detect autofocus, it has first curtain sync, high speed sync, rear curtain, slow sync, rear sync, and a bunch more stuff, including 3D tracking, which was not available on any Z-mount cameras until the Z9. There's obviously too much to mention, but the point is, this camera already has better AF than any other Z-mount except arguably the Z9. So it's really when, not if, Nikon releases a flagship APS-C Z-mount camera, you can expect basically a repeat of what happened with the Z9. There's going to be drop jaws and a camera that is sold out for a year or more. Except maybe, just maybe, they know this and are already busy producing masses of this camera before actually releasing it. And it's also possible this is related to why the Z9 sold out so quickly. And listen carefully here. Uh, I think they knew the Z9 would sell like hotcakes, but they also know the D500 replacement will outsell that camera by tenfold due to the pricing, which should be around 2000 USD, and the size, and the D500, though, was in fact, in Nikon's own words, Nikon's professional D5 with unique agility of a DX format. In fact, it was sharing the same XP5 processor as the Nikon D5 at that time. So, in other words, all D500s, and believe me, there are a lot of them, and a lot of true professionals are in that group, are expecting the Z-mount replacement for the D500 to have the same processor as the Z9, which means they probably put some aside, which is why there's probably some Z9 shortages. So based on the Z9 though, some reasonable assumptions can be made here. So we have a smaller, lower resolution sensor. So readout speed will notably be faster, something like 50 frames per second, maybe raw, uh, shooting 200 frames per second in JPEG or greater. The video resolution could be limited to something like 6K simply because going much over 25 megapixels for APS-C sensor without some ground breaking improvements tends to reduce low light. However, Fujifilm has, you know, for a long time said the X-H2 is going to be ground breaking. So with Fuji supposedly leasing, uh, releasing a 40 megapixel as well as a lower megapixel as X-H2, Nikon may opt for more megapixels. Or just like Fuji, they may offer two versions. Nikon has done this in the past with their single digit D-series, uh, so it wouldn't be too shocking to see this happen. Regardless of resolution, if Nikon allows the APS-C flagship to truly stretch its video-centric legs, it could easily top the frame rates the Z9 allows. Nikon is probably harder to predict than most camera companies, except possibly Fujifilm, but Fujifilm, you know, the Fujifilm and Nikon are both relatively conservative at times, but are also both truly groundbreaking when they release flagships. So rather than tell you what I think they will do, uh, I will simply state what I think they could do if they really wanted to, 
and like I said, maybe 6K video, maybe 8K at 33 megapixels, something like that. Somewhere in the ballpark of 100 frames per second could be done at 6K. 4K at 200 frames per second or better could be done, and 1080p at 300 frames per second or better uh, could be done. I know I say this a lot, but I personally would like to see 1440p, a la GoPro menu, uh, and would like to see it at 240 frames per second or greater. It should go without saying that RAW and all the other codecs and high bit rates and other bells and whistles of the Z9 could easily be implemented and should be. The one caveat and or excuse which could prevent some of this is that they may very well need to add a fan to the APS-C body, which could make it slightly chunkier. Personally, I would say go for it, Nikon, because it's probably still going to be the same size or smaller than the D500 since it's mirrorless. And again, since originally writing this though, uh, we see the the Fuji X-H2 supposedly is gonna have a detachable fan. Frankly, I don't see Nikon going that route because it seems kind of fiddly and the D500 is known as a robust workhorse. I think few returning customers though will decline purchasing this camera simply because it's half an inch thicker and a little bit chunkier due to a built-in fan. But, Many new owners will come on board for the D500 replacement because of video features if Nikon gives it the A plus treatment they gave the Z9. And personally, I would love to see the illuminated buttons. I do a lot of long exposure and time lapse of night skies, uh, both in the mountains and the ocean in basically pitch black conditions. Uh, I've given up on expecting Nikon to do the right thing and give us a fully articulating screen. But what this APS-C monster could finally do, in my opinion, is finally deliver global shutter to the hands of the masses. I think that it's fairly clear from the readout speed and lack of mechanical shutter on the Z9 that we are edging closer to this reality. I think it's highly likely with less megapixels and the same processing power that this could finally be reality. Now, I'm not holding my breath but I think it's not so unreasonable to expect. Or at least some point in the near future, they could do that with firmware updates or another company could do it pretty soon. I think we're getting to that point. So we can make predictions all day, but the bottom line is I think we're going to have at least two amazing APS-C flagships in 2022, or at least by early 2023 the Fujifilm X-H2 and the Nikon Z80 or whatever they decide to name the D500 replacement. Z500, why not? And I think this all bodes very well for other systems as I alluded to earlier. Basically what Nikon has done with the Z9 was to unlock all the doors and make locked off features and product segmentation no longer viable for other companies. You know, companies that tend to protect their cinema lines. <laughs> Product loyalty is really not a thing that the vast majority of prosumers give a shit about these days. And I think camera companies are getting smart to that reality and starting to figure it out. There will be a need for others to go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to maintain their market shares, and the smart companies will not only offer true, competitively unlocked full-frame hybrids, but also two companies in particular will need to stop offering watered-down APS-C offerings. And I'm sorry to say those two, Sony and Canon, have in my opinion been very lackluster in their APS-C mirrorless offerings. Now the Z50 and ZFC are by no means amazing. I think Canon and Sony may get uh, by simply on hype a bit longer and the simple fact that many who have invested heavily in Sony and Canon systems lenses uh, may be reluctant to walk away too soon. And I understand that, as I stuck with the Z6 for three years despite caveats, but I was constantly looking at my options. But I felt justified in staying with the Nikon system because it seemed fairly obvious Nikon was testing the waters for something greater. And really the Z6 delivers big in overall quality of image, which is paramount to me personally. It's humbling though to see how quickly things really can change in the camera industry, even during such trying times. Market shares aside, I think we've seen a very big shift in the pure technology advantage or technological advantages over the last year. Sony had a clear advantage in AF for a long time, but that will no longer sustain them. And I think they have always failed at the organics of cameras, which is why I 
personally never owned a Sony that and my hands just simply are too big. I believe they have their work cut out for them though, bringing comfort, comfort to the user, both literally and spiritually. But I do believe they'll figure things out sooner or later. Canon, well, they're Canon and they seem to have kind of stumbled their way just in the nick of time into the right position and they've started doing less product segmentation uh, with their full frame cameras. Though refinement is still needed in my opinion, Nikon seems to have played the slow, smart game, steering clear of the hyper-release cycles and, you know, I'm not a fanboy by any means, I'm just an observant person. Nikon may not have had a lot of excitement around the Z6 and Z7, but both were solid cameras, with the Z6 still being one of the very best full-frame cameras in regard to pure video and image quality and dynamic range. Honestly, I still want Panasonic to figure themselves out because the menus and user friendliness can't be beat. This is a little bit of a peace offering before I go too deep into this. Sorry, Panasonic. But their autofocus system is a big problem. They seem unwilling to change and I'm almost certain they are testing. I'm almost certain they are testing phase detect in a dark dingy basement somewhere in Tokyo or elsewhere. Uh, on a shoestring budget, likely. While they have their contrast detect out on production units and giving it full funding, it should be reversed, in my opinion, with contrast detect being developed in the dark and only released to the public when it is truly, truly perfected and equal or surpassing phase detect. Until then, swallow your pride, Panasonic, and accept that for now, phase detect is the standard and superior to contrast detect systems. Doing a hybrid contrast and phase detect system would likely put you in the lead of the pack because you do know the contrast detect system very, very well. And I know you've worked very hard on this for many years. Now I wanna say, yes, I'm just gaijin, okay, but I have worked for Japanese companies for a long time and I know it's very hard to sometimes tell the boss that a mistake was made. But this is one of the biggest flaws with the Japanese business model currently, in my opinion. I think it often leads to mistakes that are much bigger than they need to be. And something I hear in Japan a lot from my friends and just random people is that the Japanese of the past were smarter and that this is why industry is failing and why the economy is failing. But I think the average person in Japan today is actually smarter than ever. And it's just the very upper level bosses that have gotten lazy and dumb. Businesses were given too much power to dictate proper work ethics, and these ethics have become oppressive and stagnated creativity. It's uncomfortable for workers to give their all because being outspoken and honest is often futile and even creates hostility in the workplace. This is a worldwide phenomenon, but I think magnified in Japan because of the social etiquettes which dictate the boss is never wrong and don't rock the boat. Now, I don't think upper management will ever watch these YouTube videos, and they'll never really understand the consumer. But every time you watch and ignore the overwhelming desire of the user out of fear of admitting mistakes were made and time was wasted, and explaining the benefits of changing course to upper management, the mistakes are amplified. I know this likely will make some angry, maybe confused, and it may damage my relationship that I've been trying to maintain with Panasonic over the years. But I, I hope sooner than later that Panasonic can see uh, things a little clearer and approach phase detect with fresh eyes and optimism rather than regret. So I know that got really serious real quick, huh? I do love Panasonic. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people should know that my first camera was a GH2, and I still love that camera. It's still right behind me. But yeah, I want to see Panasonic do good for themselves. So that's it, you guys. I want to thank you for watching. Please check out filmstudiotaku.com. Um, please look at my prints, buy some of my prints, put some art on your wall, support an artist, and uh, yeah. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Everyone, please keep it real because we honestly can't afford any more fake BS in this world.
Peace.